decision from the Alabama Supreme Court has alarmed doctors, patients, and reproductive rights advocates. On Friday, the court ruled that frozen embryos created through in vitro fertilization, or IVF, are legally children and thus protected. Okay, if we're saying these frozen eggs are children, yeah. you know, who's responsible for freezing a bunch of children? Can we put children in a freezer? Because if yes. I do that to my three-year-old, you're going to throw me in jail. Right. God is the author of life. Yes. Um, he determines when life begins. He determines when life ends. Yes. We don't. We don't have that determining factor. What we want to talk about today is is the step before all this. Mm -hmm. Like the Imago Day. Yeah. Uh, this this idea that that every human life, every human being, mm -hmm. and I think you and I agree, life begins at at, at conception. Yes. Right. Yeah. Every human being is made in the image of God. Yeah. And because they're made in the image of God, mm -hmm. there is certain value and certain worth and certain dignity that's inherent mm -hmm. to every human being. That's and right. it's called the Imago Day. Dr. Williams, good to be with you again this week, yeah. brother. How are you? Great. How are you doing? Man, good. Tell me one good thing from your week last week. Yeah, I took the kids to a little cabin at the lake. Got to go fishing, got to go kayaking, got to throw the football with the boys, and it was good, man. Come on, man. Fun time with my daughter, my sons. My wife and I got to take some walks there, just get some alone time, and there great go. week. Good yeah. week. How many kids do you have again? I got three kids. I got Gracie, who's uh, 14, Silas is 12, and Elijah's 10. And I've got I've got four. Yeah. I've got a 12-year-old, 11-year-old, 5-year-old, and a 3-year-old. We are we are two kids away from a starting major league team. Hey, this is the year, twins. You can do it. <laughs> <laughs> Let's keep it going. Got to have we had all nine positions covered. <laughs> I guess we could do without a third baseman in a left field. Maybe, <laughs> maybe I don't know. But yeah. I, I, I I talk about kids because that's what we want to talk about in today's yeah, episode. Right. And it's not just kids, but um, kind of politically charged. There's mm. this. There's something that's been happening in Alabama. Mm -hmm. uh, for the last month, um, over, you know, frozen eggs. Yeah. Uh, this idea of in vitro fertilization, um, people who can't, you know, perhaps get pregnant, uh, mm -hmm. the way God had designed it, you know, what is this, what is IVF? You know, if you're not familiar with what happened in Alabama, there's an IVF clinic that's attached to a hospital and I'm just going to summarize this. Mm -hmm. So don't email me with any details I missed, but, <laughs> Um, clinic attached to a hospital. One of the patients in the hospital um, wandered into the clinic, mm. opened one of the freezers that contains these these frozen eggs, and immediately got freezer burn as he grabbed some, dropped the vials. They busted on the floor. Obviously, the eggs at that point are, I mean, I mean, it's done. Yeah. So the the few families of these eggs then sued the hospital, sued the clinic because basically. They said their children had been been killed, mm. right? Well, uh, a, a lower court decides that they're that the eggs are not children; that it's actually property. So the families can't sue for the loss of their children, but they can sue over you know their property was destroyed. Mm. But then the Supreme Court, the Alabama Supreme Court, overrules it, yeah, and says no, no, those are children, and yeah. they even quote Genesis, yeah, right. So now um, you know there's a lot of talk around you know. What is a child? Is a fertilized egg? You know, is a frozen egg a child? I heard John Stone Street talking about this a couple of weeks ago and just the implications of, okay, if we're saying these frozen eggs are children, yeah. you know, who's responsible for freezing a bunch of children? <laughs> like, like, <laughs> like, like, it like, leads like, to a thousand more yeah, questions. Yeah, like, like, like nobody's talking about that, right? Can we put children in a freezer? Because if yes. I do that to my three-year-old, you're going to throw me in jail. Right. 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 So so I think Pandora's box has, has been opened and and there's a lot of politics, a lot of legislation being presented uh -huh. in a lot of states right now around this. But but what we want to talk about today is is the step before all this, mm -hmm. like the Imago Day. Yeah. Uh, this this idea that that every human life, every human being. Mm -hmm. And I think you and I agree. Life begins at, at, at conception. Yes. Right. Yeah. Every human being is made in the image of God. Yeah. And because they're made in the image of God, mm -hmm. there is certain value and certain worth and certain dignity that's inherent mm -hmm. to every human 
being. That's and right. it's called the Imago Day. Yeah, I mean, the Bible literally starts this way, right? Hmm. Like the first chapter. So listeners, if you've read the whole Bible, if you've never read the whole Bible, let me just tell you, the very first chapter of the Bible lets us know that God created all people in his image. Yeah. He created them male and female. So right away, that one verse in Genesis 1 God created them in his image. God created them male and female. So he's given us identity. He's given us our gender. He's given us pers- uh, personhood. He's given us purpose. He's given us value right away. And that lays a foundation for everything. And so right now, yeah, huge conversation in IVF world. And it gets to the question, what is personhood? When does life begin? What does it mean to be a person? Does this person have value or does this person have value? Yeah. Do you have to be a certain age? Do you have to be a certain location? They have value in the womb, but what about outside the womb, right? Like, so we have all these questions, and, and the Bible already answered all this for us from the beginning, yeah. saying, yes, they all have value. The, the, it begins at conception, and you're made in God's image. Yeah, and not only does it begin at conception, but it, it, it goes until the Lord calls you home. Yes. Like, like yes. God is the author of life. Yes. Um, he determines when life begins. He determines when life ends. Yes. We don't. We don't have that determining factor. So, yeah. think about this. Think about two things in our culture that are kind of taboo, right? You think about abortion. You think about suicide. Mm-hmm. You know, I I tell believers all the time. Abortion is horrendous because you're mm. um, you're ending someone's life, mm. right? But it's more horrendous, right? When God looked at Adam and Eve and said, be fruitful and multiply, God, uh, and, and, and I want to say this carefully because I don't want this to sound negative, but God is the only being who has a right to be narcissistic hmm. because of his glory, yeah. because he wants his glory to be everywhere. Hmm. So when God says, be fruitful and multiply, he's telling Adam and Eve, I want you to make little image bearers of me, yeah. and I want you to fill the earth with it, right? That's good. God wants his glory, his image to go to the ends of the earth. Come on. So what makes abortion an atrocity? is not that an innocent life is being taken, which that's terrible. Yes. But it's that we as humans think we have the right to stop the glory and image of God from come going. On, come on. That's what makes it terrible. Yes. We don't have that right. No. And that's what makes suicide terrible. And oh, by the way, suicide is not the unforgivable sin. Right. It's not the unpardonable sin. I know people believe that. That's that. That's not when the Bible talks about that sin that can't be forgiven, that blaspheme of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. It's talking about those who deny the faith. Yeah. Those who just deny Jesus yeah, as Lord and not, Savior, right? Not suicide. But what's terrible about suicide not only, I mean, suicide is supremely selfish, yes, mm-hmm. right? Um, and it's us playing God, yes. Mm-hmm. But but it's, it's literally you saying you know better than God does yes. about his image and his glory. Oh, no, no, absolutely. no. God wants you to carry his image, and he wants you to carry his glory to the ends of the earth, right? Mm. Because it goes back to that, that Imago Dei, like, like we are not our own. Yeah. You know, we were bought at a price. And, and to your point, we have purpose and we have value, and that... Value is God derived. That's so good. That, that purpose is inherent in us. Yeah, there, there's a lot of theologians and scholars who, for thousands of years, have written on what is the meaning of being made in the image of God. What, yeah. what does that mean? You're made in the image of God. I'm made in the image of God. And there's a, and it's not just Genesis one. Throughout Scripture, there, there's a lot of passages that talk about the image of God. It talks about Jesus being this perfect image of the invisible God. It talks yeah. about us being conformed to the image of God, uh, that we are being renewed in the likeness of God. It, it shows us that even after the fall, even in a sinful, broken world, we're still image bearers. We're still made in the image of God. And, and the three main views usually on the meaning of image of God in theological circles is some believe it, it, it says something about us and the attributes of God that because we're made in God's image, that we kind of reflect some of his attributes. Yeah. Uh, others will say, no, it says something about mission and what we're supposed to do. Like, you know, John Piper says, an image, images. Yeah. You know, so if you create a statue of George Washington, your purpose of doing that is that when people look at that statue, they'll think something about George, George Washington, Washington, right? right. And, and to your point, as image bearers, Images should image, and the point is someone should look at us and it should point them to God, say something about who God is, right? We're out there being image bearers. And then the third view is this idea of relationship, that being made in God's image, which, by the way, 
humans, mankind, are the only thing in creation that is said to be made in God's image. Dogs are not made in That's God's right. image. Giraffes trees. are not made. Trees are not no. made in God's trees image. Trees don't look like God, bro. And the stars are not yeah. made. <laughs> yeah. So it's uniquely human. And one of the understandings of that, one of the interpretations of that, is it means that only humans can have this intimate relationship with God who created us, right? And I think there's some truth to all three of these. You know, Augustine, Douglas Moo, and others have said that being made in the image of God means we have capacity for a relationship with God, right? So, so that's that theological foundation. But the modern-day application, we can't overstate. This has implications for, yes, yeah, suicide, abortion, IVF, racism, human sex trafficking, pornography, euthanasia, euthanasia, right? Like all of this comes down to, is there value in life? What does it mean to be a person? And yes or no, are we made in God's image? Because if we are, then it has implications for all of these things. Yeah. And those implications are so deep and so wide because I personally believe that this is one of the, this is one of the biggest issues in our society that's plaguing our society that mm. nobody wants to talk about or address. Yeah. When you lose the Imago Dei, oh, man. when you lose the inherent value in humanity and a human person, yeah. bro, everything goes to pot. Everything. Right? So I think about, I think about the objectification of women. Yeah. Right? I was, I was reading something by Peter Yonker recently who said, um, if you want to close down strip clubs, hmm. we just have to bring back the Imago Day, right? Because objectification and lust doesn't want truth. It, mm. it, it only stands on lies, right? Mm. Could you imagine, could you imagine a strip club full of men and then right before the dancer comes on stage, and Peter talks about this, right before the dancer comes on stage, um, she's introduced as, hey, this is Sultry Susan, but her real name is um, Tiffany McCarthy. Hmm. Uh, she's been married twice. Her last relationship, she was abused. Hmm. Um, she come from a divorce home. She grew up in Iowa. Hmm. Uh, she has two kids right now. Um, she has a dog that she loves. And more than anything, she wants to be a dental hygienist. Hmm. And she's going to come out and dance for you. Come well, on. that would empty out the club because yeah. you just, instead of objectified her, you just personified her. Yes. Right? You yes. gave her a name. You gave her a dream. Yes. You gave her a hope and, 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 and a purpose. And, and objectification, to objectify something, you have, to, you have to forget about all that or pretend like that doesn't exist. You saw it with David yes. in the Bible. Oh, yeah. Right? David sees Bathsheba bathing. Mm. Right? So it's, it's, it, it's one of the clearest, most pornographic scenes in the Bible. You have a man sitting on one roof watching a naked woman bathe on another roof. Yeah, just completely objectifying her. Completely objectifying her. Doesn't know her name. Doesn't know who she is. Doesn't care. He just sees something that, that he wants, right? Mm. So the next day, the Bible says that David asked a friend, who is that woman? Hmm. And the friend, I think, knowing David's desire... Mm immediately personifies her and mm. says, oh, that's Bathsheba, the daughter of, the wife of, mm. right? He immediately personified her, man, that's somebody's daughter. Come on. That's, that's Uriah's wife. And oh, by the way, he's one of your mighty men. He's one of the men that lays down his life for Come you. On. And immediately he personifies her and David doesn't hear it, bro. He ignores it all. He ignores it all. No, and that's what we have to do. Like you're saying, to objectify women, to look at pornography, to go to a strip club, to, you, you have to ignore the image of God. Right. And so, one, we have a whole population in our culture that doesn't even believe in the Scripture, doesn't even believe that people are made in the image of God. Then you have others who call themselves Christians. They say they believe that we're made in God's image, and yet somehow their actions say differently because when you, you have to ignore the, the image of God doctrine in order to look at pornography, you have to ignore, ignore the image of God doctrine in order to be a racist. That's right. You even have to ignore the image of God doctrine to talk negatively about somebody That's you know right. james brings that up james <laughs> 3 james says with your mouth you praise god and with the same mouth the same tongue you curse men and then he adds who were made in, in god's image, image. That's so like that good, should bro. you know the guy cuts you off in traffic do you say he's made in god's image or, or do you honk your horn and cuss him out you know yeah. uh, and we all struggle with this right like we forget 
that the people around us, we, we did a, another episode where we talked about politics and we talked about how to respond to people who vote differently than us. And that's the thing right now, too, you see in the churches, if you vote differently than me, we end up hating you, we cancel you, we talk negatively about you, we get on social media and we just tear you down, completely forgetting, no, that's not a Republican, no, that's not a Democrat. First and foremost, that's a man or a woman made in, in the image, image of, God. of God. Dude, that's so good. I just got um, I just got invited. So a couple of weeks ago, I took my pa- my pastor's a huge Baylor fan, mm. Baylor Bears, basketball. Baylor Bears, sick of Bears. Yeah, he's a hooper, man, so him and I connect on that level. So... I got uh, really good seats to the TCU Baylor uh, basketball yeah. game. Yeah. Right? These are two Christian colleges. Yeah. Okay. So my pastor and I, we go to this game. I do not know how young men make it on a college campus today, mm-hmm. bro. Everywhere I looked, there was an attractive woman. Mm. Everywhere I looked. Mind mm. you, I'm at I'm at a Christian college playing another Christian college, and I'm with my pastor. Yeah. And as I'm walking through the game, as I'm walking through the arena, bro, there, there are beautiful women everywhere. And, mm. and immediately I'm trying not to lust. Mm. Immediately I'm trying not to objectify, right? Mm-hmm. Do you know what helped me? It was this thought. Yeah. I just began recycling in my mind, man, that's somebody's daughter. Oof. That's somebody's future wife. Yeah. That could be somebody's wife, right? Could be someone's sister. That could be somebody's. That's somebody. No, it is somebody's sister. Yeah, come on. It is somebody's daughter. It is somebody's wife, right? I I immediately began to to add personification to that person, bro. And the the desire to look, the desire to lust went away. Look at that. Because because I was preventing my heart from. And then I thought thinking about my own daughter. Yeah. You know, my, my my daughter wants to go to TCU and in six years she may be there. Yeah. I don't want some I don't want some guy looking at her as the way I'm capable of looking at these other girls, oh, right? Yes. Right? So so even in my own heart, just this this principle of the Imago Day, right? If we can somehow, you know, implant that within oh, us, yeah. make that be the trigger, make that be the mechanism, oh, yeah. right? It just it doesn't just fix the whole the whole lust pornography mm-hmm. side of it but to your point the racism side oh you know, there's a reason why we saw so much fruit from the civil rights movement and there's a lot going on there but at the heart of it i'll say this if nothing else this might be a simplistic view but martin luther king jr believed everyone was made in the image of god come on everyone was created in the image of god and there's a reason why some of the movements that have started in our nation over the last five six years that say they're focused on ending racism they, they will come right out and say they don't believe the Bible. They don't believe in God. They don't believe in any of that. And so their foundation is so shaky and sandy That's that right. it's not going to see the same fruit. Because at the heart of those organizations is not a belief that everybody of every race, of every ethnicity is made in God's image. That's right. But MLK, he had that foundation. Well, he had it. it and, was and in, he built on that. It was, in the, it was in the speech. You yeah. can't listen to I Have a Dream. Yes. The I have a dream speech is basically the Imago Day in that modern language. We put it in our constitution. A hundred percent, bro. That we believe that we are created in God's image with these uh, rights that we have in our nation, and we have drifted so far from that, from MLK, to where now yeah. people don't even have that. But I, I will say this. There's something, I think, almost innate within us that sees truth in that, right? Like there's something in us that if if something bad happens to a you know five or six year old child, there's some anger that arises, even in a non Christian, even a non Christian, you know, that supports euthanasia. It gets a little different if you're talking about your granddad or your grandmother. Right. There and and there's a reason why you're talking about the lust and pornography issue. Right now, one of the biggest movements taking place in pornography is moving to AI pornography. And I think a part of that is that innate understanding that, well, if it's fake, if it's, it's computer-generated, if it's artificial, it's okay. then maybe it's okay. Yeah. But one, it's, no, it still is lust and it's still sinful, right? Yeah. But two, even that kind of thought betrays your understanding that the other people you've been looking at in pornography are made in God's image. Yeah, well, you'll just dehumanize them even more. Yes. Well, and the IVF thing is is similar in the vein, yes. right? IVF is not God's design for mm. child rearing, mm. right? The design for child rearing is 
um, man marries woman, and then they have children. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, because of the fall, because of medical advancement, things of that nature, we can go outside of God's creative order and Mm -hmm. and do different things. And I'm not saying that's right or wrong. Uh, We can do that Mm -hmm. on another show. Yeah. Right? Uh, But what happens is every time you go outside of God's order, Every time you go outside of God's design, whether that's through medical advancement or whether it's through artificial intelligence, the the end product will be a dehumanization, mm. right? It's going to be, we're going to value life mm. less and less. So instead of honoring the elderly, mm. right? And there are still a lot of cultures that do this today. You know, Asian culture does this really well. Mm. Um, Hispanic culture tends to do this really well. They they esteem and they value the elderly. Yeah. Right. Um, in the West, we don't. Yeah. Right. Once you become old and obsolete, we kind of just push you out to pastor. Yeah. Literally, in some instance, yeah. right. So you see the the promotion of euthanasia, right? They really don't have any more value. Mm-hmm. They're not really producing or, or being helpful in society, so we can just get get rid of them. Which is why the marginalized are typically bearing the brunt of this. Yes. I, I read an a article recently that Down syndrome children mm. have basically disappeared in Europe. Mm. Now, the article painted it like they had cured Down syndrome. But what the article was really about when you read it is because of m- modern medicine and technologically advancement, you can, you can identify certain genes and certain chromosomes mm. in the womb. So if they identified those chromosomes that led to Down syndrome, they just terminated the baby. They aborted the baby. To where over the last 30, 40 years, the majority of Down syndrome children have been aborted throughout Europe. Oh, I remember when we were pregnant with our first, the doctor asking, do you want to do this test to see if it's likely that your child would have Down syndrome? And I asked him, I said, what would be the purpose of it? And she goes, well, you know, just so you can make some decisions. Yeah. And I, and I kept pressing, asking. And I was honestly curious. This is our first child. I didn't know what was going on. And, and finally, she's like, well, you know, we do the test. It's a 75% chance, uh, you know, correct or whatever. And uh, it might tell you by 75% chance that you might have a Down syndrome baby. And then you could choose if you want to have an abortion. Yeah. And I said, this is our child. You know, we want to have this baby. That's it. And when when someone's pregnant, too, I've been thinking about this. We all, Christian or non-Christian, when someone's pregnant, we talk about the unborn child as a child, as a baby, as a human. I've never heard a woman say, yep, I got an embryo in me. We'll see if it becomes a fetus. <laughs> you know, hey, I got a fetus in me. I've had this fetus in me for about six months. Another three months, we'll see if it becomes a person or not. Yeah. They always say, there's a baby in my stomach. In That's nine right. months, the baby's going to be in my arms, right? Like we, again, just there's a, an innate wisdom within yeah. us that understands Yes, that's life. Yes, that's a person. The question is no longer, you know, really, where does life begin? I think scientifically, we, we all understand that's a life. Yeah. Unborn, in the womb, not in the womb, that, that's a life. The question is, does it have value? That's it. And like you're saying, we've come to a place in our culture where we say, if you're young enough, old enough, disabled enough, maybe you don't have value. If you're in the womb, maybe you don't have value. If you're doing IVF and you're outside the womb, maybe you don't have value, right? So we base value not on the image of God doctrine. We base value on age, value to society as perceived by me and my understanding, or even location, right? Like location determines if you have value. If you're in the womb, no. Outside the womb, yes. Uh, Outside the womb in IVF, no. Outside the womb after you've been born, yes. But older, no, No. right? Like we just are making this up as we go. Bro, we're building a plane in the air and we're literally rewriting the rules every day. Yes. And, And what this comes back to at the heart of this is probably the most prolific sin in and outside the church today that nobody talks about, Mm. and it's the sin of partiality. Mm. It's what James talks about right there in in, in the opening chapter of his book, that we treat people differently based upon what we perceive as their value. Yeah, what can you contribute to me? Right, or or how much money they make, or where they live, or what they drive, or the color of their skin. Mm -hmm. It's the sin of partiality. And what I love, what I love about the gospel Right. Somebody asked me one time, they said, Chris, how do you know the gospel has taken root in a church? Mm. And my answer was simple. 
It's when a janitor can disciple a CEO and no one thinks differently about it. Come on, that's a good word. That's how you know when the gospel is taking root because the sin of partiality has been eliminated Yes. because we're no longer valuing people by what they add or don't add, by what they look like or don't look yes. like, by what they drive or don't drive. We're valuing people because they are made in the image of God. That's it. That's They're it. made in the image of God. Yes. They have inherent dignity. They have inherent worth. They are, they are worthy of love mm-hmm. and honor and respect and kindness for nothing else yes. if they're just made in the image of God. Come on, that's and, it. And when we can start responding to people like that, right, mm-hmm. then we can start practicing Philippians 2.3. Think about this. Philippians 2.3 mm-hmm. says considered others is more important than yourself. Come on. You can't do that if you don't understand the Imago Dei. Yes. Because you have no reason to consider somebody as more important than yourself. Yeah, you have no reason to. If they don't have value until you've learned how they benefit you, then you're never going to put them. And, and that's what we do, right? We that's meet it. someone, and whether or not we value them, whether or not we respect them, whether or not we love them, we, we almost put it on pause. We're like, well, that's an unanswered question. We'll see. And, and we spend time getting to know them, and at some point, maybe we decide, you know what? You, you do benefit me. Yeah. You do contribute something to me personally. Therefore, you have value. And that is not at all what we see in the gospel. Nope. And praise God that he doesn't treat us that way. Come on. I mean, bro. if God was waiting for me to get to the point where somehow I benefit him right. before he cares about me. Wait you know, a long time. <laughs> wait a long time. I mean, the Bible says while we were dead in our sin. Offering nothing, bringing nothing but sin to the table. Yeah. God sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for us. Come That's on. the kind of value. Why? Because we were made in God's in image. image. And he came to rescue yes. these image bearers who had been fallen, who, who were sinful, who were dead in their sin. He, he, you know, so many have said it so well. He didn't come to make bad people good. He made, came to make dead people alive. alive. That's right. It. And so praise God. He values us because we're made in God's image. So why can we not show what we have known so well from the Lord? Well, it's so good that 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 song, nothing in my hands I bring, Oof. simply to the cross I cling. Come on. That's it. Yes. And, and it's interesting. When you look at the Psalms, um, the word thanksgiving, the word praise, mm. the Hebrew word there is yada, mm. yada, and it means open-handed. Oh, I love that. Which is why we don't praise to God with clenched fists. Ooh, we oh praise man. to God with open hands because because all we can do is receive. I love Jonathan, that. we don't bring anything to the table, yeah, bro. I and love he that. made the table. <laughs> like That's like right. like he owns That's it all, right. dude. We bring nothing but sin and rebellion and depravity. And God sends his son, Jesus, to renew us. And yeah, so I would say this. If, if you're struggling right now uh, with hate, yeah. of anybody, someone who votes differently than you, a relative, someone that you've canceled years ago, it, someone who views COVID differently than you, right? Yeah. If you're struggling with hate, if you're struggling with racism, if you're struggling with prejudice, if you show favoritism to people who are have more money than other people, right? If you're struggling with your views on abortion and you don't value the unborn life, if you're struggling with your views on the elderly and you don't value someone once they get to a certain age or once they're in a nursing home, if you're struggling with your views on the disabled and you have a hard time in your heart of hearts, you honestly say, I I value them less, right? If that's where you're at, I think what would bless you so much is to actually just spend some time meditating on the image of God. Just read every, you know, there's dozens of scriptures that talk about the image of God. You know, you can Google it and just go through every passage that talks about that. Pray about that. Consider what does that mean for yourself? What does that mean for others? If you struggle with pornography, if you struggle with lust right now, meditate on the image of God. Like you said, it it worked miracles for you at that basketball game. Yeah. That one thought. Imagine what it could do for our listeners just meditating on the image of God. Yeah. Yeah. Or the listener right now who's thinking about ending his own life. Come on, you were made in God's image. You were made in God's image. Like you, there is hope for you and there is purpose for you. Like God has promised that. Yeah. And you have value, you have worth. If everyone in your life um, doesn't believe that or if everyone in your life is telling you something different, listen to what the Word of God says. The Word of God says you're valuable. The Word of God says you're loved. The Word of God says you're important. Mm. The Word of God says you have purpose, right? You don't have to take your life. Yeah. And and you shouldn't end your life. No. The the glory of God, the image of God is impressed upon you, man, and you get to carry that forth oh, in a dark and dying world. 
Man, I, that alone is enough reason to live. Just keep living. I've had friends who considered suicide. They, they got as close as you could be. And God saved them from that. And now they look back on that and they are so thankful because now they understand their purpose, their meaning. They're running the race. They see themselves as image bearers made in God's image with value, right? And, and so if you can just push through the, this season and cling to God like you talked about, cling to the cross, yeah. I, I believe he will renew you, restore you, and you could live the rest of your life with purpose and value for God's glory. That's it, man. They did a study. So the... The Golden Gate Bridge is an infamous place to commit mm-hmm. a suicide. Yeah. People will jump off the Golden Gate Bridge. Well, interesting enough, uh, when the tide's right, um, people who have done it, sometimes they don't die. They live. They live. So over the course of, you know, 100 years and people trying to commit suicide on the Golden Gate Bridge, there's been 20, 30, 40 people that have survived. Mm. So they went. Someone had the wherewithal to go interview those people. Mm. And, and, and they ask a series of questions, but one of the questions was, as soon as you let go of the bridge, what was the first thought that came into your mind? Mm. And across the board, everyone had the same thought. I wish I didn't. I wish I hadn't done this. <sighs> they regretted it immediately. Immediately. I wish I hadn't done this. Your foot leaves the bridge, and immediately you, you want right, to take it back. Because there's something in you that tells you, man, you have purpose. Yes. You have value. As a church, as believers, we have to understand recognize we have to promote the imago day come on you were made in the image of god i was made in the image of god yeah. man we've got purpose we've got value we've got worth amen it changes so everything it does man great to be with you today brother thanks See you next time.